We are moving now to the next uh, presenter. It's the last presentation from the day. Uh, we have uh, the privilege with, to have with us Richard, uh, well, now here I go again, Piccioni. I think, uh, I hope I, I pronounced uh, your name uh, correctly. Um, yes. Who is going Beautiful. to talk to us about generating simple HR diagrams of global clusters using Gaia data in the web browser. I'm really looking forward to that. Seems a very, like a very nice activity. And uh, so you know the drill, you have 20 minutes and uh, I'll let you know when you have five minutes and you choose if you want to take some questions. So thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Well, well thank you very much for giving me this uh, chance to share something that I, uh, pretty much, you know, recently learned. I'm not an astronomer. I'm a physics teacher with the occasionally asked to teach some astronomy. Um, so I learn new things every day and um, I learned how to do this. So I thought it would be fun to share it with everybody. Um, uh, and thank you for uh, being up so late. Uh, most of you watching this instead of you know, something more interesting like your, your children. Anyway, so um, the, the basic idea is that um, as uh, Frazier uh, mentioned before, we live in this world of big data and um, uh, among the biggest uh, data that there is are um, astronomical data. And I think that presents an opportunity for students and I'm talking about students who, um, you know, these days, the students are, are a lot of students across the world are quite comfortable interacting with the internet, obviously. And I think there's a large number of them that would have fun doing things like this. So, and uh, certainly it could be something that could be assigned to high school students and uh, undergraduates um, also. So what do you do? You start out with the uh, Gaia uh, database, which is, we'll talk about it some more. It's enormous. You do a search using their website. You download the results of that search into a Google spreadsheet. Uh, and, and then you make a nice graph. And this is a, uh, a Hertzberg-Russell diagram, also called a color magnitude diagram. And, um, and uh, it shows many wonderful things, way more than I understand about this particular globular cluster that we uh, are looking at. You can infer something about its age and all kinds of other interesting things. Um, and once you show the students how to do this, there's probably a lot of other things that they will be able to figure out. Oh, there are a lot of other things that they will be able to figure out on their own. Okay, so, um, yes. Really, it's going to do that to me. Okay, got it. All right, so what is Gaia? Gaia is a beautiful spacecraft that is, um, it's not really orbiting the earth, it's orbiting this location, which is uh, one and a half million kilometers uh, away from earth on the other side of the sun. And it sort of follows us around as, as we orbit the sun. And it has um, this uh, enormous uh, shield that protects the optics from, from uh, the sun. And inside there are two uh, telescopes, really, uh, two systems of mirrors and very fancy light detecting equipment. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it's a beautiful, um, uh, thing. Uh, let me see some facts about it. Uh, it's a project of the European Space Agency. As far as I know, it has nothing to do with the United States, which is fine by me. Um, it was built in France and launched on a Russian rocket. 
Um, there have been two, there have been a couple of different releases of the data, a major one in 2018 and a more recent one in 2020. They have data on over 1.3 billion, they call them sources, because most of them are stars, but there also are other objects um, like asteroids and so on. And, uh, uh, and for each one of them, they have about 100 data elements. And they have collected, by the time this project is over, they will have collected this data something like 70 times for each of those sources. So there's all these data elements and, um, and many of them are measurements made to unprecedented precision. Um, so you have the positions and also the motions in uh, the right ascension and declination coordinates. You have their uh, brightnesses, their parent brightnesses in three wavelength ranges. You also have spectra, but I don't, I'm not talking about that at all because I know even less about that. Okay, and you have parallax angles, which I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't use uh, because I just use the absolute, uh, the uh, uh, apparent magnitudes. It's enough. Okay, no, you don't do that. You do this. What do you do? You do this. Okay, so is a general kind of thing, uh, what, what, is does it mean to work with astronomical image data generally? Um, the universe is a source of uh, images which we capture in telescopes and produce these raw image data which get processed. And uh, when they're processed, they, that information is stored in various kinds of image archives, catalogs, other databases. Uh, that image, that, that information can be used to explore, generate hypotheses, test those hypotheses, come up with results and share them, well, with the universe. So it's a nice cycle and students can enter and leave this cycle at various points. They can capture their own images if they have a telescope. They can look at image archives where of images that have already been uh, uh, captured and they can explore catalogs. It, that's what the Gaia archive is. Essentially, you could think of it as it's a catalog of, of sources of 1.3 billion of them and other databases. And all of these things can be explored. The students can generate hypotheses which they can test by going back into these, uh, these sources and produce results. So it's a kind of a, uh, a, a, a flow of information. And I said, as I said, students can enter and leave at various points, depending upon their interest, their ability, the amount of time that the teachers have. And I think it's really important for those of us who are developed curricula, always to keep in mind what Rosa said uh, the other day, which is that the needs of teachers are very different and you can't just expect to produce something and say, oh, they will do this uh, particular thing. Some will, but if you want to really reach a lot of people, you want to have flexibility. So there's a sum of that in what I'm doing today, not as much as there should be. Okay, so here is what I do, um, what I've learned to do. Uh, I, you, you go into the source data, either the data release two or the data release three, and with the name of a cluster and it, its apparent radius. It's it, how big, it, how much of the sky it takes up. And you can just get that, you know, from by on Wikipedia or something like this. You don't have to get fancy. Um, then you design and run the search. Uh, using that information, you look at the results of that search that may make you want to change your mind about how you're doing the search. That's fun. Then when you're satisfied, you download uh, a CSV file, which you then import into a Google sheet. I just use Google because, you know, it's, uh, it's in my browser. And if I had a Chromebook, I'd be able to do all of these things or a tablet. And then, you know, you just uh, import it into a sheet and um, you do some formatting and naming of ranges 
uh, you can create a kind of a quick draft of an HR diagram. And then very likely you will want to do some refining because when you take the data from a piece of the sky, essentially it's a circular piece of a circular area on the sky. Um, you, there are lots of stars there that, that, that are not part of the cluster and you want the HR diagram of the cluster. Only the members of the cluster get to play. So, uh, so there, one way to, um, to select those is based on the, the proper motion of those stars. The idea is that if you have a cluster of stars that are gravitationally attracted to one another, perhaps they are moving together through space. And if you can kind of isolate the ones that are moving together, separate from the, one, from the others, maybe that's a way of, of, um, of getting an HR diagram of just the cluster members. Who knows? Anyway, it's, as my thesis advisor told me, it's an industry. Yeah, people have been doing this for years, but uh, here's how people like me can do it, who know almost nothing. Okay, so the, yeah, so you end up filtering the rows and you get a nice HR diagram. That's the basic idea. Yeah, okay, so anyway, here are my results. All right, well, this is my results. And this is a, uh, a figure taken from a very sophisticated paper by these two uh, 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 researchers uh, from Argentina. And uh, this is their, this red is their um, uh, HR diagram of what they think are the members of this cluster. I, I think they're worried that they are missing some. But you see all of the stars that were in the field of view are shown there in the, with the gray dots. So there's lots of stars in the field of view, but when they do a selection based upon many fancy tricks that they do, they get this thing. And I got this. So I was pretty happy uh, with that. Oh, what do I see? I, well, this is part of the main sequence, I guess. And this, uh, this cluster is so old, it's so old, that a lot of the stars have become red giants and this thing they call the turnoff here. And some of them have even gone into the horizontal branch and a real astronomer could tell you what that means. But in the meantime, uh, I, I think that's a pretty nice, uh, a pretty nice graph. So um, uh, here are some alternatives. Um, uh, which we can we can uh, explore if you want. You know, if you have if you have students, you know, more and more of them these days uh, like to program. If they want to get their 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 involved on that level, one thing they could do is um, is use a uh, is use a um, a Jupyter notebook. It's called a Google. A notebook that requires no installation, a Google Collaboratory. It's very nice. Um, thank you to Irene, who uh, helped me uh, program that. And of course, if you're really serious, you use this thing called TopCat, which is really fun and beautiful. And uh, But it does require installation, and maybe not all of your students uh, can use that. Good. So how much time minutes? left? Yeah, you have five minutes. I have minutes. five minutes. Okay. So can I do this live in five minutes? Let's see, probably not, but I can try. Stop me after five minutes. Okay, uh, he wrote a great article about uh, all of these things and I put a reference to it there. Yeah, oh, oh, let me do that. There was one more slide. That's probably at least as important as me making a fool of myself trying to do this. Yeah, so um, this is the archive link. I made screencasts of how to do this, which you're, you, if you watch them, you know, it's a, it's a total of about a half an hour of going through step by step. And here are some, uh, here are some references which might be useful. Okay, so just to get you, just, just, just for fun here, let's see. Let's suppose we want to find out something about this nice cluster. And let's look at a radius of five arc minutes. And um, the only thing we wanna do here is make sure that there's proper motion data 
and this is the funny way you do you, uh, of, of putting a condition. Ooh, which columns do we want to display? Well, we, I mean, there are a hundred of them roughly, it's too much. So let's keep it down. We don't even actually even need the parallax. You know, let's just go like that. That's good. Radio velocity, that's for the professionals. Good, we want the color and we want the magnitude. Sounds good. This is just a little test to see if everything's okay. It could be worse. Ooh, look, there's some missing data there. That will be interesting. So we go like that and then we go show query. Okay, so this shows uh, the, uh, the, the, the query in the query language uh, that has been generated from that other screen. And we give it a jobs na a name just so we keep track of things. And uh, what else, what else, what else? Oh, we want all of them, huh? not the top 500. We want all of them. So let's see how many we get. Ah, I did this search before. So 17,000, 17,000 stars. Okay, uh, that should be interesting. And then you just download it as a CSV table and it will be called the same thing, eggs result, that looks good. And then we open up a, uh, a, a guy, this, this is one that exists already, but, uh, and if you just go import, and then you, uh, wait a minute, import upload, so to file for your device. And there he is, open that thing. A little trick is a create a new spreadsheet. I like to remind it that this is comma separated and do that. And there's a reason why you do that. And 15,000 rows, was that it? 15,000? Open that thing. Okay, great. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that these are all, whoopsie, 15,000, you know, there's a little bit of a lag. I've done this with some nice other data and uh, it's, I've handled, you know, 100,000 rows if you have patience. Uh, format, number, make them numbers, okay. Okay, good. So did that work? Yeah, looks like it. Okay, so then, you know, quick, quick little graph. Uh, let's see, chart. Uh, what kind of chart? Are you gonna come up here? Column chart. No, I don't want a column chart. I want a scatter chart, scatter brain chart. There we go, scatter chart. Ooh, that doesn't look like anything I've ever seen. Patience. All right, so you got like this. And the point size is like two. And it's nice to make them kind of transparent because there are a lot of them piled up. And ooh, that looks nice. Um, what else? Oh yeah, the X and the Y are wrong. This is the, you want the X to be the color and the Y is supposed to be the magnitude. And this would be what any reasonable physicist would do. But astronomers, you guys are really wild. You like to do things backwards. So this is, this is upside down, although it looks like a very nice tornado. It's an upside down one. So you, you, the way you solve that problem is you create, uh, you create a calculated column here. Let's call it negative G mag. You would think the Google people would allow you to reverse the vertical axis, but they don't. And here's something I love to do, and I find not that many people, not everybody knows about this. It's called named ranges. And you can give names to ranges. And then when you write equations, you just use the name of the range. I want the negative of GMAG. There he is, right there, boom. And then you just copy that. Now, command, yes, back up. You know, you could do all kinds of things like freeze the top rows, all kinds of things that your students may very well know, know how to do. Or this is a great opportunity to teach them how to use an electronic spreadsheet because you're doing something actually interesting with it. And then we introduce our chart again, insert our chart. And of course, it's a it's a 
scatter chart. And I love to do this thing of making the dots smaller and making them a little bit transparent. Why not like this? Okay, well, that's starting to look like something reasonable. Uh, another thing to customize is the horizontal axis. You know, no reason to include every, every single star. I mean, come on. And um, let's see, don't want that. And oops, I lost the thing. There we go, edit the chart. Uh, what about also the vertical axis? We're wasting lots of space there. Uh, I don't think they go, Gaia goes below a magnitude of 21 and looks like 10, negative 10. Yeah, that, sorry that the numbers have to be negative, but that's the, like, that's basically it. There you go, boom. And then if you wanna get fancy, what you do is you, um, you do a selection on the proper motion. Yeah, and you make yourself a little histogram of the proper motion uh, uh, column. And you say, oh, it's like this. And uh, maybe I should just get the ones kind of that are in the middle. And that can get rid of a lot of the others. Here's a really cool example of that. Now, this is something you might want not, not want to do at home, but this is a very big part of the sky that has um, that is centered on an open cluster, namely uh, the Pleiades. And it's a hundred thousand rows. Uh, and you know, Google Sheets is hanging in there. Uh, here is the uh, the uh, Hertzberg-Russell diagram, the color magnitude diagram. And you see there is this beautiful little thing there. And you're thinking, huh, I wonder, I wonder, maybe the students, I wonder if that is, those are the members of the open cluster and all the others are just stars that happen to be sneaking their way into the, into the photograph. Uh, what is it called? Video bombing. Okay. so. You make, you make, you turn this into a little if statement here. I say how to do this in the, in the screencast, and then you can narrow it down. Now, patience is required because poor Google Sheets is handling here 100,000 rows. Oh, when you do the histogram, you see that most of the stars are, are here, have proper motions out here, but there's a little bunch of them that have much higher proper motion. Ah, so let's go after those. Fun. So how about if we put in 48 to maybe, I don't know, 52. Now you have to wait because it's not instant gratification here. But, uh, you know, 48 to 52, that doesn't look good. Well, it worked before. So anyway, you can explore. And your students can explore. And you know, every student in the class can say, oh, pick a globular cluster. That's yours. That's your globular cluster to investigate and explore using these tools. And I think that will be fun. And I have tried it to a limited extent. Brilliant, and Richard. My I, so I allowed you to, to, to stay a little bit longer no. and show that. No, no, too much. Absolutely too brilliant. Much. I now want to do it, and I think we have a, a very nice uh, exercise. I hope you you will have the you will allow us to to use uh, your exercise, and maybe you can create a full tutorial that we can explore further. This was absolutely brilliant. I really love it. Very okay. very nice. Thank well you. done. We have uh, uh, one question in the Q and A. Richard, in your workflow, how do you separate out the proper motion to get the final nice HR diagram? Well, I think right. you, you just uh, showed this to us, right? Y yes, you, um, you put it in here for the, the column that you are plotting on the vertical axis. You, I wrote this little piece of code here. And the reason it doesn't have, you know, cell cell addresses is because I named these 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 ranges, 
And so I said, well, if the proper motion is greater than the minimum, the minimum is this value here. And uh, if it's greater than the minimum or less than the maximum, go ahead and plot the negative. Otherwise, don't put anything in either way. Okay. Well, we, we see that Carl also have a question. Carl? Yeah. Hey, Richard, do you think uh, students who aren't, you know, are sort of moderate, medium level in a physics classroom or in a physical science classroom, could they get this and get excited? Well, you know, if I knew how to excite uh, students, I, 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 I would uh, win some kind of prize. So, uh, you know, they're different. Every child is different and they're different at different ages and they're different on different days. But I think what this has is some flexibility because you could, for example, for some students, just give them the spreadsheet, you know, and give them the spreadsheet already with these columns and then they just graph it and they think about the graph. Or wow. you could, you know, so there are many entry points. And I think somewhere in there, um, you know, I think you can, you could, I, I, I think it's worth trying. Uh, Richard, Vindra is asking if you have shared the Excel files with the formulas and graphs, if you can please share the material with everyone. Yes, uh, yes, I, 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 I put links into my PowerPoint, uh, my uh, slide presentation, and I will do whatever you need me to do, Rosa, to, to share them in, a, in, in better ways. Well, I think Gustavo will ask all the presenters to share the material and that will be available, right, Gustavo? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, that will be available after the conference, you know, to take some time to get that all Where the material. But... The files are going to be available in the website of Hands on Universe? And yes, that's if you should go for the conference website, that's where we share the materials. Okay. Carl, you have one more question? Yeah, you know, and Fraser could chime in here, I bet. You know, Richard, this is fabulous. And I'm thinking, you know, if we had a general cone search tool that could do this, you know, with the cuts through Sloan or Sloan or Dark Energy Survey or LSST, that, that would, you know, a lot, that, that encapsulates a lot of what astronomers do. You know, we could make the Piccioni uh, galaxy cluster diagram instead. No, forget stars, we'll do the Piccioni galaxy cluster diagram. Well, yes. I would call it. I would call call it the Penner Pennypacker Piccioni uh, oh, cluster. No. Well, we can discuss. We can discuss this. But is that is that hard, too hard to do? I mean, you know, with Irene. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I you know, the the, the 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 trick is this: not to get confused that what you're doing is for educational purposes. For demonstrative purposes, you are not creating these diagrams on a level of professional research use. So you can relax a bit and use methods that are pretty good, give results that are meaningful, even if they don't rise to the level of being publishable in a peer reviewed journal. I think that liberates the mind quite a bit. Bravo. That's great. Thank you very so much. Good. Very, very good. So I guess, Gustavo, over to you. Yes, thank you, Richard. Excellent presentation to wrap up this, this session uh, nine. Uh, 